in New York, and he was just going around being a good benefactor and helping others when he felt the impression that he should move his family to Kirtland. And so they packed up, came to Kirtland, arriving just in time to make that $2,000 payment for the, in, in behalf of the church. And he, he had a note from Joseph Smith that they would, he would be repaid. Eventually, he forgave that note, and Joseph promised him that his posterity would never have to break, beg for bread. But people like Nathan, uh, President Nathan Tanner, were some of his descendants. Another person I like to talk about while we're going down to the sawmill and ashery is <clears throat> Isaac Morley. Isaac Morley had come here as a young, uh, young man, and he had purchased 130 acres, built a log cabin, went back to Massachusetts to marry his sweetheart, Lucy Gunn. Brought her here, the newlyweds got set up in the cabin and then he got called to serve in the war of 1812 after just two weeks. And he went to serve, but he came very ill after 41 days and he was discharged. And he made his way back home and, and they, uh, she nursed him back to health. They developed their farm and he had a wonderful farm. He had, orchards and he was a cooper he made barrels they had honeybees they had maple sugar maple trees where they could make sugar maple sugar and maple syrup and he also had sheep for wool and they would make yarn and probably weave also well the um we'll talk a little bit more about isaac morley but what a, what a great family he had. He eventually started a, a commune out on, his, out on his farm where they just had everything in common. And five or six families lived out there together. Well, this is the restored ashery or the rebuilt ashery. The ashery had burned down here in, in Kirtland, but it was a business that was owned by Noel K. Whitney. And he, he had... Uh, he consecrated all of the proceeds from the ashery to the building up of the temple. And Sister Gardner tells me that there's another missionary couple in there. So we're going to go over to the sawmill first. So they needed lumber to help build the temple. And they <clears throat> purchased 16 acres of old growth forest. And they approached the local sawmill and by Lyman and Loud about cutting it cutting their wood for them. But Lyman and Loud said they were too busy with contracts and they, they couldn't cut the wood for them. Well, Joseph Smith heard about a new convert by the name of Joel Hills Johnson that was a millwright and he could build sawmills. And so he wrote him a letter to come here and help the saints build a sawmill. And within... Um, within six months, they had their own sawmill in operation here. This was a sash sawmill, and they that blade would go up and down about 120 times a minute. It had a carriage that would drop that would pull the log past the blade, and it was very efficient. They could mill over a thousand board feet of lumber a day. And they eventually were able to have enough wood to not only build the temple, but also to um, sell for, for us for other building projects. That's the water wheel. Usually it's running. It might have been too cold this morning to start it. The water was probably frozen. But this is Stony Brook. That uh, creek is, was diverted up above here and run. That was what ran the, the sawmill. Not only did they have a, the sawmill here, but they also had a wood shop in which they could do some of the finer woodworking. They believed that the pulpits for the temple were built down here and then installed in the temple. They had a, a molding plane. This is a molding plane. It was powered also by the water wheel using a rope to tie to that big wide plane. And then it would they would tighten the rope on a shaft over here 
and then it would pull the plane through the wood. Then they would have to let go of the rope and pull the plane back. And this is a wood lathe they believe they had here. This wood, this sawmill has also been reconstructed. It was destroyed by, by fire, and, but they found artifacts in this area that led them to believe that the sawmill was here. Um, they, they, uh, most of this labor was all done with consecrated labor. So the people would meet here every morning, they would have prayer, and then they would uh, go out to their different uh, crews. Some would go to this, the, the uh, ashery and some would go work on the temple and some would work here in the sawmill. But have you ever heard of Joel Hills Johnson before? Have you ever sung High on a Mountaintop? He wrote that hymn. He was, not only was he a millwright, but he was a, a good poet. He wrote over a thousand poems during his lifetime. So, well, I'll finish telling you a little bit about Isaac Morley. Uh, he had a young daughter named Lucy after her mother. and and he was, um, let me just stop right here a second. I'll turn this around. So he, he had this young daughter and, and she was working for a neighbor. And the young daughter, one day as they were working, somebody knocked on the door and they, they were busy. So they just said, come on in. Well, in walked the missionaries and started teaching them about the Book of Mormon. And they, uh, Lucy's employer, Abigail Daniels, did not want to hear about it. She didn't believe it. She thought it was a hoax. She ordered the missionaries out of the house. And uh, they said, well, we haven't had anything to eat all day. Could you, could you at least give us something to eat? No, she said. I, I'm not going to help you. Well, as they got up to leave, young Lucy Morley uh, went uh, went up to him and said, if you go to my dad's house, he'll give you something to eat. He doesn't turn anybody away. And so they did. She directed them to, to his house, to her house. And they went there and, and had something to eat. And then they taught the, the Morleys about the gospel. And while after that, the, the missionaries taught the Morleys, that, like I say, taught the Morleys about the gospel and and they were converted. About 17 of the group were baptized at midnight that night. Imagine that, huh? Yeah, they, these people, I'm telling you, they were prepared to hear the gospel. They were eager to, to follow New Testament Christianity as, as presented by the missionaries. And that was what was being restored. Well, as I said, this was owned by Newell K. Whitney. He consecrated the, in, the proceeds from the ashery to help build the temple. And much of the labor here was done by consecrated labor. They, they didn't get paid. So what's an ashery? Well, it was basically a chemical plant, believe it or not. They would go out and send an ash man out into the community, and he would collect the fireplace ashes from your home. And uh, also if you were a farmer, uh, he would collect the, the ashes off of your, where you had been clearing your ground. And they would pay 75 cents for fireplace ashes, a bushel, and they would pay 25 cents a bushel for the farm ashes. And they would bring them back here to the ashery and they would put it in these big hoppers and they would run uh, spring water down oh, that sun's really uh, spring water down over the ashes and they would collect the water at the bottom well the water while it was going through the ashes would leach the lye out of those hardwood ashes or the acid and it would become very strong if you put it through there several times which they did many times and and they but we believe they had an office down here where they could test their product keep their records. As Sister Gardner said, Nil K. Whitney was a great record keeper. And they had barrels that they could ship their product out in. Well, when they had that really strong acid water, 
they would bring it down to the other end here into this brick part, the kiln kind of, and they would boil that acid water for 15 hours in these big pots. And they would have to stir it regularly. Can you imagine stirring boiling acid for 15 hours, especially in the summertime? You'd have to wear heavy aprons like that and be really careful. Then and they would let it cool off after 15 hours and it would be so thick it would harden. And that would, they would break it up into chunks and that was called potash. And this is actually lava rock, it's been broken up, but you get the idea, it's, it would be something like that. Well, potash could be used in gunpowder, in the textile industries, glass making, in the leather industry, medicine, it could be used for a lot of things. And it was in great demand. They could sell it for $100 a barrel. But if they wanted to refine it a little more, they would bring it down here to the reverberatory oven. And they would bake it for two and a half days, reaching temperatures of 1,000 degrees. And that removed the, the impurities out of the potash. And it turned it white. So they called that pearl ash. Now, pearl ash was worth... $200 a barrel instead of just one, 100. And it was in great demand. They could ship it all the way to England, in fact. And they would use it, as I said, in the textile industries and in other things. But these big cauldrons, uh, this one was found in the debris when the church was getting ready to rebuild the ashery here because it had been destroyed by fire, uh, it, when they were rebuilt, when they were getting ready to rebuild, they found this cauldron in the debris and the, in the, under all the, the debris from the old ashery. So that's an original one from the 1830s. Now, another thing that they found in this area was uh, they found a pit where they had been discarding the ashes from the, the used ashes out of the ashery. And as they did so, they uh, were digging in there and they found, they found that pit, as I said. And as they were sifting through those ashes, there was this one layer that whole, had a whole bunch of broken tobacco pipes in it. Wonder where they came from. Probably the School of the Prophets, right? Yeah. And so there's some of those broken tobacco pipes pieces of those tobacco pipes out there in the church history museum in salt lake i've seen them but uh wow wow who are they Warren, okay mm -hmm. Mm hmm Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Tell you what, I'll go look and see on that register if Warren Smith is on there. And if he if he is, we'll we'll email it to you or text it to you. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Long time for the night. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Uh, that is awesome. Is it? Isn't it great to hear the stories of these early saints? You know, I think it's important that we remember these things. Um, and, and I always like to bring out in the book of Ether over and over again throughout all those years. If the leaders remembered the great things that the Lord had done for their fathers. They would stay faithful to the Lord. They would be righteous. But when they forgot the great things the Lord had done for their fathers, they became wicked. 
And remember, yeah. <laughs> remember, ever and ever again, it, he tells us that, doesn't he? And so, well, we have really enjoyed sharing these things with you. And, and we just, there's just marvelous stories here in Kirtland, and we just have enjoyed sharing them so much. You bet. Yeah, yeah. The Johnson Inn wasn't there, and the yeah. Ashery and the Sawmill weren't yeah. here. Yeah. Right. Too bad. <laughs> that that river behind there is called the East Fork of the Chagrin River, and in that East Fork was where a lot of those people were baptized in the winter of 1831 sometimes they had to cut through the ice to get baptized that's pretty brave i don't know that i could be that brave <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah yeah me too well i had a i had a great i had a great grandfather that lived down near hiram ohio and 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 uh, my great grandfather, not a double great, but he lived there in the 1830s. Had six children born there, and uh, eventually joined the church. They, I know that they would have known Joseph Smith. And he, yeah, he became a, a member of the police department in Nauvoo. His name was Eli Elias Gardner. And, and eventually went out, out west in those early days, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what's been really neat for us is to be able to give these tours to people from all over the world. You know, I mean, the other day we gave a tour to somebody in Wales and somebody here in the States all at the same time. Well, we had Australia, well, and Mike, uh, New, uh, Zealand. New Zealand was on here today with you. <laughs> and so uh, there's no bounds to it. You know, we've given people tours in Chile and Argentina and North and Mexico, Russia, and the Ukraine, and uh, Saudi Arabia, and, and Dubai. Dubai. Yeah, South Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thank okay. <laughs> We're going to go west. <laughs> yeah. 